Well, good morning, New Hope. Uh, it's so good to be with you. Good morning to those of you joining us online or over at our Mask On service. It is so great to be able to gather and be able to worship our Lord and Savior together and encourage one another. I want you to know at New Hope we're doing everything that we can to open things back up while doing it in a safe manner. And one of the things that you heard in announcements and you'll be hearing us pushing in the next several weeks and months really as we launch forward is to attend one service and to serve one service. We really believe that church isn't just about what you receive but that each and every single one of you have something to bring to the table. And, and so uh, with Sunday school starting up around the corner, Wednesday night classes around the corner, different small groups and Celebrate Recovery and all these different ministries that we did at one time offer, it takes volunteers. So when you are comfortable and you feel ready, let's be a church that continues to serve. And let's not just get back to where we were. Let's move forward. Let's, let's look forward to even greater discipleship and even uh, going further than we have in years past. We are in week two of a new series called Biblical Worldview. And if you missed Pastor Jeff's sermon last week, you should go back online and listen to it. It's a fantastic message. And today I'm gonna be talking to you about biblical accuracy. George Barna did a study where he surveyed Americans and the study revealed that two thirds of Americans believe that the Bible is the actual or inspired word of God, but only one third of Americans believe that all of the teachings and principles found in the Bible are actually accurate. Those stats don't seem to compute in my mind because if you believe that it is the word of God and it's actual or inspired, then I would believe it to be true. But we know that there is an attack from Satan to get us to question the accuracy of the Bible. It's the same tactic that he used in the very beginning of time with Adam and Eve, where he went to Eve and he said, did God really say that? Is, are those words really true? Is, are, are you sure that what God said that he meant? And as soon as Eve questioned the accuracy of the Bible, it left room for her to question the authority of the Bible. And then she undermined it. She rebelled, causing the fall of man. I've had conversations with both Christians and non-believers who question the accuracy or the legitimacy of the Bible. And quite honestly, I don't know that the church has done the best job at addressing some of these questions and these doubts. Some really good people with good hearts and good intentions have, have been caught saying, you just have to have faith. You just gotta believe. How dare you question the authority of God's word? It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, or, or don't you know that doubting is a sin? How dare you doubt the integrity of God's word? Well, I'm here today to tell you new hope that I believe that our church could benefit from a few doubting Thomases. That doubting can be a good thing in your faith. That questioning what you believe can be a great thing if you allow it. Why? Because when you go searching for honest answers, you will find them. God has not left his existence to be a mystery to us. He's left his fingerprints everywhere in this world. And when you have honest questions, you will get honest answers. If we rise up at the church and we believe what we actually believe and we move from a feeling that validates our faith to facts that validate our faith, that's when the church launches forward and we're no longer hot and cold in our relationship with God because when my feelings don't feel it, I know it, right? So let's move from feeling to fact this morning. The problem is that most people are lazy when it comes to asking their questions and when they have doubts, they don't really wanna dig. You might pose a question like, how can we trust a piece of literature that was compiled from 40 different authors over 1,600 different years and translated out of the original language that it was written in? How can you trust that? But they never go digging. This morning we're gonna dig and we're gonna find bedrock because when you dig and you search for answers, you eventually hit rock and that's where we need to build our foundation of our faith. My goal this morning is to equip you in your faith so that when questioned, you might be able to confidently lead others to truth. Now normally, at this point in the sermon, I would have you turn in your Bibles to a particular scripture and we'd read from scripture. However, this morning in preparing this sermon, I felt strongly not to 
go straight to scriptures. Instead, I'm going to put up on the screen a list of scriptures, and this is your homework. These scriptures talk about the accuracy of God's word, the nature of God, and who he is, and his word, and the truth. All of these things, this is your homework. Jot these down. Take a picture, and this is your reading assignment for the week. But if you or someone that you know is struggling with questioning the accuracy of God's word, then to prove the Bible's accuracy with the Bible would be very circular. How many understand what I'm saying? If you're already questioning the source, you can't use the source unless you dig into the entire Bible, and that would take way longer than we have for several years of preaching. This morning, I'm gonna give you information found outside the Bible that will hopefully lead you to a place of confidence in the accuracy of the Bible. And I hope that you'll take notes this morning because when your brother or your sister or your coworker or your friend or your relative around Christmas time comes asking that you would have answers, that we would not be a, a church that is dumbed down, that we would know why we believe what we believe. So take notes this morning. And before we do, we just, I, just, I feel like you guys are maybe a little bit um, snowed in this morning. So these two sections right here, Right here, you guys see me? Yell, let's. Let's. Okay, you two sections, you're gonna yell, get. And you two sections, you guys are my favorites. Nerdy. All right, let's get nerdy. Let's get nerdy. All right, let's get nerdy. Are you guys ready? Let the fun begin. We're gonna talk a little bit about a guy named Alexander the Great. How many have ever heard of Alexander the Great? All right, some of you slept through that class. Does anybody know what year Alexander the Great was born in? Nobody? Bueller? 356 BC, and he died at the age of 33 years old in 323 BC. Does anybody know how Alexander the Great died? He died of the flu, ironic, because we know that he was a world champ. He dominated the world in 13 short years. He never lost a battle. We know that he named over 70 cities after himself after he would conquer the, the, the battle. He named one after his horse. We, we uh, know that he was a great force and cause of Hellenism. Does anybody know what Hellenism is? Any Hellens in the house? No? Hellenism. Anybody know what Hellenism is? It's, it's the influence and the spread of Greek culture, right? So when Alexander the Great, being a Greek, he would, good job, John, he, he would um, come in and he would change the language and everybody would speak Greek there and they would worship Greek gods and, and that is the spread of Greek. That's why the New Testament was written in the language Greek because of Hellenism. We know that after he died, his body was stored in a vat of honey to preserve it. Does anybody know who tutored Alexander the Great? Aristotle. Good job. Got one history nerd here. Society believes all of this to be true. And where we get all of this information is from two primary resources. A guy named Plutarch, who was born in 46 AD and died in 119 AD, and a guy named Arian, who was born in 86 AD and died in 160 AD. What that means is that society is willing to accept this as being 100% accurate and true, despite the fact that from the time of Alexander's life to the time that we have record of it, there's over 400 years. That's a long time. Let's move on to Julius Caesar. What is Julius Caesar uh, known for? No, not Caesar dressing. And no little Caesars, okay? What year was he born in? No. Nope. He was born in 100 BC and he died. Anybody know how he died? 
That's exactly right. Point for you, Stephanie. Murdered in 44 BC. We know that he was extremely militaristic. I'm going to butcher this spelling, maybe. Uh, We know that he was a politician, a very strong one at that. He uh, formed an alliance with two other politicians at the time and became kind of this trifecta, and they really became much of a dictator, which is probably why he died. He was an accomplished author. Two of his main works that we still reference a lot today was his autobiography, which is where we get a lot of the information that we have about Julius Caesar through his autobiography, which um, to me, I hope I'm not stepping on any toes, but it just seems a little vain that you would write a story about yourself. I went to a funeral one time, and none of you guys know this person, so I'm free to share this, where he wrote his own obituary, and it was like seven pages long. It was very uncomfortable to see how much he thought of himself in that time. And so uh, Ale- or Julius Caesar, um, you know, wrote an autobiography, but another major work that he had was the Gallic Wars. How many has ever heard of the Gallic Wars? That's when Rome, uh, or the Greeks, took over a lot of modern day Switzerland, Belgium, France, northern Italy, kind of that area. And uh, those wars took place from 58 BC to 51 BC, and he wrote a personal account as he led those uh, attacks, those uh, military advances in there, and he wrote it around 50 Uh, BC, we don't know exactly when it was originally, and the earliest copy that we have of that comes 950 years after the original date of penmanship. Yet, society is willing to accept all of this, what we know about Julius Caesar, what we know about the Gallic Wars, as being truthful. Let's talk about the Bible in the New Testament for just a little bit. You guys with me? All right. The book of John. Most scholars believe that it was written between 80 and 95 AD, which would mean that the book of John was written during a time called living memory. Now, living memory is something that oral historians refer to as a time of period where you're writing while there's still witnesses being alive, okay? We live in a living memory time period right now of World War II. There are people that were around during World War II, maybe they served in World War II, and so if we wrote something, there would be witnesses that could dispute what we are saying and, or validate what we are saying. We know that Jesus was born in 4 BC, and he died in 30 AD. Now, that might be a little bit confusing because you're thinking, oh, BC stands for before Christ. Why is he before it? It's a little bit complicated. I don't have time to get into it today, but we know that through Herod's death and Jesus' ministry that it's 4 BC. Someone screwed up the calendar. You know, just blame Kevin. Come on, Kevin. So what this means is that from the time of Jesus' death, to the time of the penmanship of the book of Mark, there's approximately 50 years, and it was written within living memory. The earliest fragment, which I'm just gonna put EF right here, just so I don't have to write all that out, that we have of the book of John is dated at 125 AD. Some historians even would reference that fragment to as early as 90 AD, putting it inside the first Century. So what that means is from our earliest fragment at a conservative um, estimation of time to the time of Jesus' death, less than 100 years that we have in between those time periods. So what that tells me is that society is willing to accept all of this as truth despite being written 400 years after its account. Society is willing to accept all of this as being accurate and true despite it being almost a thousand years from the earliest copy that we have of this, but we're gonna question the authority and the accuracy of God's word even though we might have a fragment even within 60 years if it is early at, at that 90 year mark. I think what that tells me 
is that the world doesn't really have an issue with accuracy. I believe that the world has an issue with authority and therefore will use accuracy to remove themselves from falling under the authority of God. I forgot to mention one thing. We have over 24,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, while there's only 251 copies of the Gallic War. And Matthew and Mark were written prior to John, which would mean that um, the distance between Jesus' death and the penmanship of Matthew and Mark would be even fewer than 50 years. And I don't have time to go into this today, but if you were here several years ago, Dr. Wave Nunley did a presentation that uh, what can we know about Jesus from outside the Bible looking at first and second century texts, and we see that every major assertion of the New Testament about Jesus' biography is supported by those texts. If you want that information, I'd be happy to share that with you. I'd be happy to email that with you. It's something that he's given me permission to do. How many of you guys need a break, right? All right, we're gonna take one anyway. This is a picture of my family that we took on Tuesday. You guys see Essie down in the corner? Their tongue out? <laughs> Acting like her mommy? Can we just admire just how beautiful I am? I just, that's great. All right, that's enough of a break. We're gonna jump back in here. Let's dial it back to 1946, okay? We've been kind of flirting with all this old stuff, right? Let's, let's bring it into this, uh, it's more living memory, right? 1946, something very important in history happened where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. How many are familiar with a place called Qumran? The Qumran Caves. If you've been to Israel with our church, it's very likely that you've been to Qumran. These caves are found just outside of the Dead Sea. That's why the scrolls are called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what happened is in 1946, a Bedouin shepherd was out tending his flock and he threw a rock into what he thought was an empty cave, but he heard a crash, he heard a crack. And when he went in, what he discovered were thousands upon thousands of ancient Hebraic manuscripts. And one of the manuscripts was named the Isaiah Scroll, which you can see here on the screen. If you've been to Israel and you've been to the museum in Jerusalem, which absolutely puts the museum in Washington, D.C. Of, of history to shame, it's not even, I could spend a week in that place. You have seen these scrolls. That scroll is approximately 24 feet long, and it's the oldest complete manuscript complete manuscript of the book of Isaiah. Now before the find of this scroll in this picture, the oldest complete manuscript we had of Isaiah was found in the Masoretic text in the 10th century AD. Now when scholars, this is where it gets really neat guys, when scholars compared the Masoretic text of Isaiah to the Isaiah scrolls found in the Qumran caves, the correspondence was astounding. The text from Qumran proved to be word for word identical in over 95% of our, to our standard Hebrew Bible, the Masoretic text. The 5% of variation consisted primarily of obvious slips of pen and spelling alterations. Further, there were no major doctrinal differences between the accepted and Qumran text. This forcibly demonstrated the accuracy with which scribes copied sacred texts, and it bolstered our confidence in the Bible's textual integrity. The Dead Sea Scrolls have increased our confidence that faithful scribal transcription substantially has preserved the original content of Isaiah. Now, previously, the Masoretic text, the oldest text that we had of the book of Isaiah, was dated at the 10th century A.D., they date the Isaiah scroll, which you saw a picture of, at 100 BC, just 500 years after the prophet Isaiah wrote it in around 600 BC. Now why is that important? That means from 100 BC to the 10th century AD, over 1100 years, the text of God's word was accurately being translated and copied after copy after copy with hand written 
copies. That's amazing because God cares about the accuracy of his word. And you can have confidence, New Hope, that today what you're reading in your Bible is exactly without doctrinal error what would have been written thousands of years ago. We can have confidence in the accuracy of the Bible. The reality of Jesus and the accuracy of the Bible is without question when you take a look at the evidence. And I end with where I started. I personally believe that the people who question the accuracy of the Bible, or even in Jesus' existence, either one, haven't truly dug for answers, and they've just asked those questions as an excuse, or two, they're using those questions as an excuse to fall under Uh, to, to remove themselves from falling under the authority of God's word. Many historians, secular historians, believe more in the existence of Jesus Christ than they do in Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar, just based on pure number of sources that talk about an individual. I was reading lots of different forms, studying on this this week. I, I like nerding out from time to time. Let's get nerdy, you know. Um, And, and there were people that just were ignorant. And I don't say that to be mean, because ignorant is not calling someone stupid. It's not calling someone dumb. It just means that they do not know. And I saw time and time again where people would comment and say, the only account we have of Jesus' life is from the Gospels. How can we know that it's true? And the number of likes on those comments were through the roof. And I just, my heart broke. I'm like, if only you knew. I've got a list of 16 different first and second century te texts that talk about Jesus and support the claims of the New Testament. Let's be a church that digs in and knows why we believe what we believe. Satan wants you to get out of the word of God. But hear me, he wants to do that because he wants to remove the power from your life. Do you feel stuck? Are you struggling? Let me ask you this. How many times were you in the word of God this past week? How did Jesus overcome temptation to Satan himself? Saying face to face with, with Satan. How did he do it in Luke 4? He, he quoted the word of God at him. There is power in, in the word of God. It's why it's called the living word of God. It, it transforms the way that you think about life. It transforms the way that you see people and you begin to see people as image bearers of God and see people as souls going one of two places. It transforms your heart and the way that you feel about things and Satan wants to get you out of the word because when you are out of the word, you become a wimpy, pathetic, complacent, out just of power Christian. There's power in the word. It transforms you. Listen, Sunday school's around the corner. It's gonna be starting up. It better be packed. It better be full. Small groups and, and Wednesday night Bible studies. Why do you think it's always hardest to get up on, on Sunday mornings for Sunday school? Why do you think that is? You think that's just coincidence, or do you think that there might be a spiritual attack? You know, Pastor Hawkins used to tell me this, that s Saturday night into Sunday nights, his whole family, the kids wouldn't sleep as well, he wouldn't sleep as well, and it'd be like a spiritual attack on him right before he's supposed to give the word of God. If you don't believe in a spiritual attack that God, Satan is trying to keep you from getting in the word of God, open your eyes. We need to just pull up the bootstraps a little bit and say, God, help me be faithful to your word. Some of you guys need to emerge yourselves in small groups where you're studying the word of God. You become studious, that your, your faith isn't up and down because one day you feel it and one day you don't, but your faith becomes eddy steady and, and steady eddy, not eddy steady, because you have fact now. Yeah. And, and we walk with feeling and we walk with fact and it complements each other so that we can be secure in our faith. Psalm chapter one, verses one through three says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in what? Whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person 
is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. You want to be a Christian that bears fruit? You better plant yourself next to the river, and we know that the source is Jesus Christ, but when we're planted is when we are in the word of God. That is the number one way that God will reveal himself to you is through the word of God. You feel like you don't know who God is? Get in the word of God. We as a church need to rise up and equip ourselves so that we can answer the questions and doubts of our children and grandchildren. Feelings come and go, but the word of God is true. Some of you are so focused on the surrounding and what's happening in our world and what's gonna happen in the future. Get out of what's happening and know that the word of God is true. It's an anchor and we can have peace because we know the outcoming. We can have peace because we know Jesus, the author of peace, and we get to know Jesus through the word of God. I'm well aware that today may have not been your favorite style of sermon, right? Like it's, it's a lecture. It, this is a teaching. This is not really a, a preaching. But I believe wholeheartedly that this is one of the most important things that you can study And it might be one of the most important sermons that we've shared yet of 2020 because this equips you to know why you believe what you believe. I shared all this for three reasons. One, that your faith would go from feeling to fact, that you would gain confidence in the accuracy of God's word. And two, that you would be equipped in engaging in conversation with your coworker. Some of you guys are are coming up to holiday season where you see relatives that have persecuted you or questioned or or laughed at you or scoffed at you for your personal beliefs in Jesus Christ, and they've asked you difficult questions, and you've shied away from them, and you've become a silent Christian to those that are closest and nearest and dearest to you. I hope that this sermon is just one tool Not that you would go and beat that person over the head with the hammer that I just gave you, because how many know this? It's more important to be kind than it is to be right. And and it takes a balance of both. It is not your responsibility to change anyone's mind. It is not your responsibility to save anyone. Only God can save us. But it is your responsibility to love that individual. And love is not complete without the truth. They go hand in hand. So I hope that as you go and you engage in conversations, you'd remember remember your uh, responsibility, but you'd also do it in a spirit of kindness. And third, I share this, that you would recognize the importance of filling your mind with the inerrant, perfect word of God that brings true change. You want to be a better husband? Get in the word of God. You, you want to be a better spouse? Get in the word of God. You want to be a better parent? Get in the word of God. You want to be a better worker, an employee, a coworker, a friend? You get in the word of God and you allow the living power of God through his word to transform your mind and your eyes and your heart. Would you stand and would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? In just a moment, we're gonna be led by a song by Pastor Brett that I asked him to sing, but before we sing, I just wanna take a moment to quiet our, our hearts and allow God's just still small voice to speak to us. What is it that God is speaking to you? If you're watching online, I just encourage you, don't tune out, close your eyes and allow God to speak to you. What doubts and questions have you ran from in fear that you would get wrong answers? Because God sees your questions and he sees your doubts and he's bigger than all of those things. And he wants to reveal his truth to you. Is there an area of the Bible that you are questioning the accuracy of? And if so, is the root of that questioning because you have more of an issue with the Bible's authority than the accuracy? Have you really cracked open the word of God and really 
dug deep to find out the truths that he's left for us. What is God speaking to you? Maybe, maybe you feel like you need to start a, a, a devotional time with your family in the mornings. Maybe you feel like at, at dinner you just need to put the phones away and, and you guys are gonna go through a devotion. I can point you to wonderful resources. It's, it's, it's not hard, it just takes discipline. What is God speaking to you right now for you where you're at in your life, in your marriage, in your family? So with every eye closed and head bowed, I just wanna be able to pray for anyone here that just might be struggling with doubt or questioning God. And I want you to hear me very clearly. God's not intimidated by it, and he wants you to go searching because he is truth. So if that's you, with every eye closed, and you'd say, Pastor Austin, I'm just struggling with some big questions. I don't know exactly maybe who to turn to, but, but I wanna find those answers, and I'm maybe a little afraid to, to ask these questions. Would you just raise your hand out of vulnerability? Is there anyone here? Yeah. Yeah, is there anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, you see these few hands, Lord. I just pray, God, that in this moment that they would feel your spirit come alive in their hearts and that for a, a moment right here, a glimpse that their feelings would align and that they would know that they're on the right path but then work would, would follow today and that they would dig deep in their faith, that they would dig deep in apologetics, Lord, and that your spirit would come alongside them because you have not left us or abandoned us to be on our own and figure this out on our own, but your spirit is with us. And so Jesus, this morning, give us a hunger and a thirst for your word. Allow your church to rise up, to be literate, and know what your words, what's right and wrong. Let your words impart on our heart. In Jesus' name, Lord, change the way we think, see, and feel. And may they align with you. With every eye closed, I just want to give an opportunity to anyone here that knows that Jesus loves them, but they have yet to ask Jesus and place their trust in Jesus and ask Jesus to enter their life, to forgive them of their sins, to take their feet and place it on a, a path of righteousness. And if that's you this morning with every eye closed, anyone saying for the first time, yes to Jesus, I want to be saved, I trust in your plan, would you just raise your hand? just want to be able to pray for you. If you happen to respond to that, I pray that you would reach out to me. Send me an email, austin at newhope.church. And church, I pray that you guys would be faithful Christians and get in the word of God so that we can have an answer in every situation.